At some point, every parent needs to hand over control of their children to God. Here's Nancy Damas Walgamuth. Lord, I give this child to you. It's not that you no longer love. It's not that you no longer care. You certainly keep praying and loving and, and as God opens doors, speaking truth into their lives. But you're not doing it as an owner or as a controller or as one who can fix it. You're saying, Lord, this child is yours. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy Damas Walkamuth, author of The First Songs of Christmas. For December 13th, 2022, I'm Dana Grash. Mary and Joseph dedicated Jesus at the temple as a newborn. It's an incredible scene, as Nancy Damas Walkamuth has been showing us in a series she started last week. It's called, My Eyes Have Seen Your Salvation. A group of women have been listening along, and they're going to share something they've learned about dedicating their children to the Lord. I don't know if any of you have ever had a child who struggled all their lives. Out of my four children, I've had one that from the get-go, she has really struggled with depression, um, even to the point of wanting to harm herself. With children like that, it's more difficult, I think, in a way to release because just something within the mother wants to feel like, well, I can do it. One more book, one more message, one more prayer, um, one more talk. And um, that's not the answer. And I had to come to the point eight years ago of deciding I'm not releasing my child just out there. I'm releasing my child into the arms of the Lord. And do I believe that God is so perfect and so loving and will do the best for me and for my child? And I had to come to that to say, yes, I do. And one day that summer, I was uh, laying in my hammock all day long. It was on a Saturday. And uh, my daughter, uh, she had uh, really struggled since high school and even in college, had gotten into drugs and we had to pull her out of college for a year and put her in a rehab. And after that, she just kept fighting uh, herself and God and had a lot of anger. She was angry with us and angry with God. And one day I lay there and I just, I read scripture all day long. I prayed all day long. And finally, at the end of that afternoon, I came to the point of saying, Lord, I really am going to give her to you, even if the worst would happen, even if she would take her life. I believe that you are so perfect and you are sovereign and you would bring good out of this. And most of all, I know that I would love you if that happened and because I know you love me and I know you love her. And that was a real turning point for me because after that, it wasn't that things were great. I mean, she really has... Um, given her life in a new way and is doing well right now. But it was just more the fact that um, it was, who do I believe God to be? (laughs) Are you trustworthy? And at that point, I felt a freedom and a relief, not the feeling that I had to be the one to solve this or to be responsible for her life from then on. So it really transformed me is what it did. I was the daughter that you're praying for. Um, When we, my husband and I, first married 18 and a half years ago, um, we were not believers. We were living together. My parents didn't agree. And my mom had been praying my whole life that I would marry a godly man. And now um, I was living the life in sin that she was totally against. They would call and tell me I was headed for hell, you know, which was true. I didn't believe it at the time. But um, we married them without my parents knowing, which really hurt them. But all through that, my mother never stopped praying. She never stopped caring. She never stopped showing love. She never was overbearing with the way she did it to me. And as a result, my husband and I became believers three years, well, two years later at the same time. Our life has drastically turned around. My parents and I are best friends. My husband is best friends with his mother-in-law. And we renewed our wedding vows with my parents there, and we wrote a letter of gratefulness to them and thanking them for their love, their prayers, how they truly exemplified Christ in their lives that we clearly saw that God truly turned us around. And I just want to tell you that for encouragement, that that's all it took was prayer. 
nothing else. I was also the depressed daughter. I did hurt myself and did some pretty horrible things. God has clearly turned that around. I had parents who never stopped being by my side. There were a couple of times my husband um, wouldn't leave me by myself, even if it was just an hour in the house. My parents were at the door without even being asking. And I'm truly grateful, and God has drastically turned that around in my life, which I'm very grateful. I just wanted to give you a little encouragement that being on the other side of what you're praying for right now, that God is good. And it did take a while before my parents saw the fruits of all her prayers. And what a reminder and encouragement that is to parents not to grow weary in well-doing, but to continue presenting your children to the Lord and trusting that God is at work even when you can't see, you don't know what he's doing, and that God is able, even when you're not physically there, to be working in those children's lives in accordance with the way you have presented them to him. You're praying, you've dedicated them to him, and you're saying, Lord, you have to do this. And then you got to trust that God is at work and that God is moving by his spirit to accomplish his purposes in the lives of your children. I have given my kids to the Lord, of course, when I was young. It's, it's really um, times when you see them do things that make you feel bad, you've hurt. And, and it's hard to remember, but even if it happens after I die, God's able to do that. But I was just thinking of Mary. When she gave Jesus up there and dedicated him in the temple, she never really, until the resurrection, saw anything but the evil in the life of her son, the horrible things that were happening to him. And so there's a lesson in that, the fact that there is a sword in motherhood. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we forget that. We, you know, unless God calls any of us, none of us are saved. And he can do that, especially when we pray. And I think that's an important reminder you just gave, that when you dedicate your children to the Lord, you are releasing or relinquishing the right to be the Holy Spirit in the lives of your children. Now, that doesn't mean you don't ever speak to them or you don't say things, but it means that you don't say everything that you want to say or that you might think because you're willing to step back and stand back and let God say to them things that they will hear better from Him, perhaps, than they will hear from you. So part of dedicating them to the Lord is taking your hands off at points. Now, I'm not suggesting by this permissive parenting, just let God raise these kids. You need to be an active, involved part. But there comes a time when you got a 50-year-old, would probably be about that time, if not sooner, um, that you cannot be uh, continually saying, this is. you can't talk to that person like a five-year-old. And even with your five-year-old, it's got to be God who turns on the light, God who causes it to click, the grace of God that calls and draws whatever age they are. It does require faith when you dedicate your children to God. This is not just a warm, fuzzy, you know, nice little ceremony. This is, this is serious stuff. You are saying, I'm going to let God be God in this child's life, and I'm going to trust God to be at work even when I can't see and when there's not anything I can say to control the situation or to change it. I felt like you needed to open the prayer room like you do at the Revive Our Heart conferences this morning. There were two things. One, when we had our first two children, we were not walking with the Lord or in church, and the Lord reminded me we had never dedicated them to the Lord, and really release those older kids, and they're in their 30s now. The younger ones, we were walking with the Lord, and I remember very clearly when they came home to us at five and seven, the pastor and my husband lifting these children on their arm to the Lord and dedicating them, and so that was such an eye-opener to me this morning, and one of these older kids just told me very, very recently that they feel God's leading them to the mission field probably out of country, with a bunch of my grandchildren. And <laughs> I have just had the hardest time. I haven't said everything I was thinking, but it's just inside been awful. And when you were saying releasing the child uh, to God for His purposes, that it release in releasing them, it relieves me of the fear of what may happen. And I honestly feel like the Lord was doing that in my heart this morning. And that was just such a revelation to me. That's why I've had so much trouble with this news, you know, that 
they're asking us to pray for God's will to be done, and I've not been able to do that because I don't want them to go, and I don't want those grandkids to go. <laughs> I'm being honest. The second is ending up with verse 29, Luke 2, 29. It says, Now, Lord, thou dost let thy bondservant depart in peace according to your word. It's not just depart in death. It, for me, I think, is depart to live, to depart in peace, knowing that I'm not responsible for either of these kids at this point, except to pray for them and trust God, like Kim said. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad you said that because I had intended to say in that session, and it slipped my mind, that I'm sure we have many listeners who weren't even thinking about dedicating their children to the Lord, maybe had no idea of what that meant or went, weren't in a church setting where that was a practice. And uh, it's not ever too late to dedicate your children to the Lord. Now, they may be making choices that you cannot change or control or fix at this point, but you in your heart can still, I don't care if they're 5 or 15 or 25 or 55, you can come to that point of saying, Lord, I present this child to you. I dedicate this child to you. I release this child to you, recognizing that this child is not mine. He or she is yours. They are on loan from you. I cannot hold on to them, whether that means they're going to the mission field or it means they're doing drugs. And in both cases, there is a release. You see your grown child involved in an illicit sexual relationship, and that breaks a mother's heart. Any of those, some are good and some are bad things, but they can break a mother's heart. And you have to come to the place where you take your hands off, where you say, Lord, I give this child to you. It's not that you no longer love. It's not that you no longer care. You certainly keep praying and loving and and as God opens doors, speaking truth into their lives. But you're not doing it as an owner or as a controller or as one who can fix it. You're saying, Lord... This child is yours. You deal with him or her. And I want to suggest you do that before you get in trouble with your kids or before your kids get in trouble. Um, But then you've got to keep doing it and keep recognizing that this child is still given over to the Lord. Because isn't it easy as a mother to take the child back? To say, I dedicated this child to the Lord, but now this child wants to go to, you know, across the world as a missionary and or as something else. And now you want to take this child back. It is a mother's instinct to gather her children around and try and protect them from life. And that's part of a mother's heart. That's part of why Mary's heart as a mother is the sort of motherhood that, um, that Dorothy talked about. And we'll talk about that later in this series, about the sword that pierces the soul of a mother. And how you have to keep presenting those children to the Lord when your instinct is to pull them back, to take back control. Yeah, Lord, I gave that child to you when he was six weeks old, but now he's 16 and this looks a whole lot different. No, that dedication at six weeks is one that still is in effect today. It means you still must be presenting that child to the Lord, letting the Lord be God over that child. And that does release you from fear. It puts responsibility on you, but it also releases you from taking responsibility that's God's. You're not responsible for what only God can do in your child's life. And that means that um, you don't have to beat yourself up when your child makes wrong choices. Now, if your child is making wrong choices because they saw you make ungodly choices and you put those seeds in their life, then you need to repent. You need to seek forgiveness from the Lord, seek forgiveness from your children. But once you get past that, if you have obeyed the Lord to the level of your understanding or repented where you didn't, then you have got to leave with God the consequences and the outcome and trust God to move in your children's hearts. Listen, I want to tell you, you can be, relatively speaking, an awesome mother who loves God, loves your children, parents by the book, the the book, the Word of God, and still have children who choose to reject or resist the ways of God for a period of time, and maybe for a long period of time. And you cannot take responsibility on you that belongs to the Holy Spirit. That's part of dedicating and releasing your children to God. And at points that may mean that you see your children at a certain age in certain areas making choices 
that you know are very unwise. And at points, it may be that you don't pursue after them, that you don't speak. Now, I want to be careful about that because I think there are times when some parents ought to speak when they don't. I said to a friend this week, I'm amazed at how often kids got married out of the will of God and you and it ends up in disaster and you ask them later, did your parents ever tell you they had reservations about this? Well, no. Well, you ask the parents, did you ever take? No, I didn't want to turn her off. I didn't want to, you know, there are some issues in life that if you see your child getting ready to do something that you know is going to have serious or dangerous consequences, you ask God for an opportunity to speak the truth. But you may need to speak it and then take your hands off and realize that you cannot keep them from marrying that person or from making that choice. That's when you get on your knees. You tell the Lord and you cry out to the Lord and you say, Lord, I have given this child to you. You pray with your husband together. I think there's power in unified, united prayer between couples for their children. Don't let this be just you. Ask your husband, can we pray together? Some parents I know fast and pray on a regular basis for their children, not because they're trying to control their children, but because it's an expression of their saying, Lord, these children belong to you. And so we are appealing to you to do what only you can do in the life of this child. The way that we're able to truly release them is by getting to know God better to trusting him more, to knowing who he is. And so I would urge the woman that's struggling with, she keeps taking her child back and taking her child back and trying to fix it, to to really study who God is, study how powerful he is, how faithful he is, that he is the deliverer, that uh, he is the king of old, working out salvation in the earth. And... um, just getting to know who he is and taking their focus off of all of the pain and difficulty that they're watching their child go through. Not that you become hardened to that at all. You pray for them more fervently, but your focus is in on what God can do because of who he is. And, and knowing that he desires to see your child brought to freedom from bondage in an even deeper and greater way than you do. And his pain and suffering really for them, watching them walk through the consequences of their wrong choices, that pain really is deeper even than the mother's pain. And that's really what Calvary's about. Exactly. That's what the cross is about. That is God taking on himself the pain that you feel as a mother for the consequences of sin in your children's lives and God taking on your pain as a mother and giving you the grace to deal with that pain. Anyone else? I just want to take just a minute to give praise to God for a long story with my son, a lot of mess, a lot of mess in my son's life. But um, I'm here to say that just a month or two ago, he stood in front of his church and dedicated his baby to the Lord. I felt like that was full circle, that he had gone from being um, so rebellious to coming to this place of being willing to say to God, here's my baby. I want to raise her um, for you. And that was just glorious for me. I could see God's, you know, behind the scenes, the way he had worked that all out. So I just want to testify to God's faithfulness in bringing my son full circle. Um, when later after we were walking with the Lord, God put it on our hearts to adopt children. And our birth kids were 12 and 14 when we started the process. And all we knew was that God would show us who they were. And we didn't know how many, what color, what physical condition, anything. And you go into a social worker with that kind of, you know, uh, list. And it's really amazing to me. They even let us continue the process to simply say that God will show us who they are. And it took a year and a half. And one day I went in and these two little pictures, just little wallet sized pictures were clipped on a folder that I saw upside down and instantly tears popped in my eyes. And I said, it's my kids. And the social worker said, no, 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 Maria, this family's adopting these children. They've been in this foster home two years. This is just their final home study I have to do. And I just said, I don't care what you say. Those are my children. This was in March. 
And I said, do you have any extra pictures? They always do. And I took them home and just tried to casually lay them on the counter like I had numerous times over this period of time to show to my husband. He took one look at those pictures and said, oh, it's our kids. Same thing I had said. And I said, well, the social worker says this other family is going to adopt them, but we've got to pray now. And we and everyone we knew started praying for those children in May. The end of May, the social worker called me and said, do you want to come meet your children tomorrow? And she said that a relative of the foster family had gone in to her and said, there are things going on in that home that ought not to be going on. And in a week's time, my kids were home. And it's been almost 20 years now. Wow. Wow. Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth has been talking with some moms about the emotional process of raising children and releasing them into God's hands. I hope the examples we heard today were helpful to you. We're so thankful Revive Our Hearts is affecting women like these. Nancy, you know, women of all ages, whether they're moms or not, are choosing to say, I'm going to stay anchored to Jesus, no matter what storms might be raging in my life today. Oh, Dana, it really gives me such joy to hear that kind of faith being expressed. You know, our team recently asked our friend Mary Cassian what comes to mind when she hears the phrase that we've kind of made our theme for this month, our anchor holds. She thought for all of about two seconds, and then here's what she shared. My dad has been an anchor in my life. He's 97 years old. And that's actually how I picture him, is as an anchor. Even into my adult years, that, that my dad is my anchor. You know, he's been my source of encouragement, support, guidance, help <laughs> whenever I need help, whenever I have a question, a building question, or you know, how do I fix this? How do I approach this? What's the best way to deal with this? It's my dad I run to. And he's 97, and he's becoming very frail. And I know that it will soon be time to say goodbye. And in expressing that to my husband, I said, you know, I feel like I'm going to lose an anchor, like my boat will be cut off from what's holding it in place. And yet, I know that I will not be losing an anchor because my anchor holds at a much deeper level that regardless of whether my relationships or whatever I depend on in life for stability and security, you know, whether it's people or my job or finances or there being enough food on the table, whatever it is that I look to as my anchor Even if that is cut off, I have an anchor that goes deeper, an anchor for my soul. And I just love that analogy that that Christ is the anchor for our soul and that regardless of what hits our boat and regardless of how many of those other anchors we lose, that we will find stability even in the midst of the most raging and terrible storm. Again, that's Mary Cassian pointing us to the only sure anchor we have, and that is Jesus Christ. You know, pointing people to Jesus and helping them get anchored to Him is what we're all about here at Revive Our Hearts. And that happens in a lot of different ways. It happens through our radio programs and podcasts. It happens through our international outreaches. It happens through the Revive Our Hearts website and app and all the content we're constantly adding to make them even more useful. All of these different outreaches are for the glory of God and to showcase the beauty of Christ and His gospel to the people who are blessed by these resources. So I'd like to invite you to be a part of helping Revive Our Hearts reach more women more effectively. As you know, the month of December is crucial for ministries like Revive Our Hearts. In fact, more than 40% of our income for the entire year comes in during the month of December. 
That's why I was so thrilled when some friends of Revive Our Hearts said, we see what God is doing through Revive Our Hearts. We believe in your goal of calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ. And we not only want to support Revive Our Hearts financially ourselves, but we also want to encourage others to do it as well. So these friends have set up a matching gift fund. That means if you make a donation of any size during the month of December, they will effectively double your donation by matching it dollar for dollar. You can find more details about this matching gift campaign at reviveourhearts.com. And that's also where you can go to make your donation, reviveourhearts.com. Or you can give us a call at 1-800-569-5959. Again, that's 1-800-569-5959. Thank you so much for helping us continue encouraging women around the world to anchor their souls to Jesus. Yes, thanks so much. So have you ever known someone who knew just what to say to make you feel better when you were emotionally low? The gift of consolation is rare. Tomorrow, we'll talk about the greatest act of consolation ever. Please be back for Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss-Walgamuth, dedicated to your freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.